joke. Rafi Head makes a comment. Sometimes you get the bear, but sometimes the bear would get you. And I'm laughing. I repeat it. I'm pulling the money. I got the money in my hand, and I feel it snatched out of my hand. And Salvi snatched the money out of my hand. Nine hundred dollars. I have, and I'm shocked. Right, and I, you know. It's Salvi, right? Welcome to this episode of Chatting with Stacks. I'm your host, Bill Stacks, and today... I got Albert Sugar Bear Barberi, also known as number eight in your scorecard, number one in your heart. Thanks That's for right. joining me. Appreciate What's you up, taking Stan? the time. Uh, no, my pleasure. I ain't got no life. I got nothing to do. <laughs> thanks, for, <laughs> thanks for having me. I guess right. Yeah, definitely. I, I so I, I want to know. I where are, know first what, what, what part of the country are you? Where are you at? I mean, Connecticut. It, Connecticut. Connecticut. Cool. Cool. Yeah. ESPN, right down the street. Oh, nice. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Sports Center, all that. Yeah. It's like a stone throw away from me. Wow. Nice. Yeah. A lot of uh, famous faces go through there quite a through bit. Yeah, yeah. I'm I've, sure they I've do. been down there. I've been down to the studio and all that. Wow. Cool. It must be cool. Yeah, it is cool. Well, I want to talk about your past and what where it all started for you. Yeah, well, you got to know now. I'm a South Philly guy, born and raised. I was uh, born September 1958 to a Thomas and Loretta Barberi. Uh, they had two boys, my brother Tommy, who's deceased almost 20 years now, and me. And uh, let's say uh, I, was, uh, I come from a broken home. My father and mother divorced when I was an infant. So, uh, and I grew up in South Philly and, um, uh, I, I grew up in a parish called St. Monica parish. <laughs> it was one of the largest parishes in South Philly known to be the rich parish. You had all different parishes. South Philly is, I don't know, I would say it's like a couple mile radius itself, maybe a mile and a half radius, but yeah. So, you know, my father was in my life. Uh, he was a good dad, being a divorcee. I uh, lived with my mother and my brother, of course, and uh, both parents did not remarry. And I had a beautiful childhood. So that you know, it's uh, South Philly. Yeah, back in the growing up in the '60s, '70s, '80s was a nice time. What? what uh, your your parents both Italian? Both Italian. Yes. Was my it Italian was a, neighborhood all around? Yeah. All well, around so, you, you know. South Philly had a different section. It's predominantly Italian, but you had what you had on, on both sides of this of the South Philly on each end. You had a section called Grace Ferry, and you had Second Street. And Second Street comprised of Irish, Polish, you know, uh, and then the same way on Grace Ferry, mixed in with Italians also, but predominantly Irish, you know, Polish, and um, and then you had your sections where your african-american section and not many there was not a i don't i don't remember there was no not many jewish families in south philly you know but that's what it was a te predominantly italian irish polish you know and uh yeah that's that's well, the makeup of south philly what was your early childhood like oh it was great it was great i like i said you know uh you know, the, the young generation listening to this just really wouldn't comprehend this. But, you know, it was sports for me. You know, I was I was a nice athlete in grade school, high school. But growing up in my uh, young teenage years, uh, Little League 12, 13, 14, um, there was a, a sports organization called Delaware Valley Youth, or, or Delaware Valley Youth Athletic Association. It's where you played baseball and your football. It was, you had, you know, it was your football. It was tackle football back then. You don't see tackle football much these days 
at, at a teenage years. They just don't do it. They play flag football. But um, I was blessed to have a, a hell of an organization. It was almost like you belonged to a Division One program. It, it was the parents of the kids were just great parents. The coaches were just nice guys that and there were great coaches. I was blessed to be surrounded with these coaches. A lot of were instrumental to to my life growing up as an athlete. And it, it was just a beautiful time. Uh, it was down in 19th and Johnson, 18th and Johnson, in South Philly playground. It was just, it was great. It was great. You felt like you were playing for Notre Dame. You know, yeah. you know yeah. I, was in, I was in eighth grade. Seventh, eighth grade, playing ninety-five, one hundred pound football, and then there was the one hundred twenty pound leveled. But then, by the time I got into high school, I played for my high school, Bishop Newman. I only played one year of, of varsity football. Played a couple years JV. I only played one year of varsity uh, football because the talent before me, <laughs> I had to wait till they graduated. I was a halfback, and then baseball. I played growing up, you know, little league. And playing with the DV, we, that's what we call our team. Our team was called DV. And then I played the varsity baseball for Bishop Newman my sophomore, junior, and senior year. And my them years were just special years, great years. Really was made a lot of friends. Still friendly with those guys that I grew up. I'm in touch with a lot of them. So it was a wonderful childhood. Like I said, just beautiful childhood. So. When you were, did you ever get into trouble or anything like that? Or were you a good kid? No, no, no. Um, in my, no, I was a good kid. I was just playing sports, never got involved in any trouble. I wasn't mistress, mischief type of a kid. Um, let me see. I'm trying to, no, nah, in school, you know, in grade school. <laughs> uh, it's just funny. You know, these names you would recognize. I went to, I was in grade school in eighth grade. Ralphie Pungitor, you heard the Pungitor family. You heard of Joey Anthony. They were involved. Uh, it's Blonde Babe's sons, Joey, Anthony, and Ralphie. Ralphie was in my eighth grade class. And then, I'm sure you know about Chicky Changalini, right? Of course. He had, he had three boys. And the middle uh, the middle boy, Joey, also in my graduating class, 72, in my homeroom. So it was me, Ralphie, Joey. And I remember we would just we were just clowns and in eighth grade, missed we'd just be ball breakers and every every other once a month, either my father or a chicky or blonde babe would have to come up that none wanted to see our fathers and tell them what we're doing and we're being just devils in class. So, you know, it was funny when you look when I look back now, it's like can you imagine Chicky Chagnolini, Blonde Babe, and my father, he was a racketeer guy. You know, he wasn't involved in mob per se, but my God, everybody knew my father, Tommy Blizzard. You know, he was a fan favorite of all, the, all the, my friends growing up. And th they would come up in suits and ties. That's how they dressed back then in 1971, yeah. 72. But no, I wasn't, I wasn't a troubled kid. Not at all. I was liked. I was easy to get along with. I made friends. And being, a, being the son of Blizzard, my father, Tommy Blizzard, who was well-liked, that helped because my father was respected in his own way. He was a nice guy, helped a lot of people. My father was uh, helped a lot of people. And uh, for the people that don't know, what is a, uh, the racketeer? You know, a racketeer guy is a guy that's involved. And I'll just I'll just use my father example, and I, and I'll tell you how I came to know all this. Obviously, when I'm growing up, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve years old, I don't know nothing. But my, a racketeer is a guy who's involved in gambling, earning money for you know the mob the, the, the you know the mafia whoever's in charge my father was a you know number writer loan shark bookmaker his horse establishments he's earning money with permission to do it uh, in the gambling in the gambling uh, f fashion of, of organized crime that's a racketeer so uh, that's that's what my the father was was there any situations when you were growing up that your father got into that you were aware of? Hey, you know, it's funny. Um, it's a funny story. You know, as I'm in eighth grade, my father would come to my games, basketball games, baseball games. And 
I'll never forget it. And it's all my father's rap sheet too. It's so funny. I have my father's two double rap sheet of all his pinches from 1947. He was born in 20, 1920. So from 47 all the way to 74. But anyway, I'll never forget. I come home from high school and I, I, I could walk down. I, I use, sometimes I, I would walk from my high school, Bishop Newman High School. I could walk to my father's house and then from there go to where I lived with my mother. And I get to the house and I see a split into the wooden door. You know, you got the wood door and the screen door. And I open and I see a split and I see it taped. A long tape that's the covering the split that happened. And I said to my father, what the hell happened? <laughs> right? Yeah. Now let's listen to the stories. These are the these are how the stories they tell. Somebody from the neighborhood called because they seen the exhaust from the dryer that's on the bottom of the house, right? On the pavement, the steam car. They thought it was a fire, right? This is the this is the bullshit my father's throwing at me. The disguise that vice squad came and with a hatchet busting down the door to make a pinch. You understand? This is the story my father gives me. Of course I drink it and swallow it. What do I know? You know, I'm a I'm a freshman or sophomore in, a freshman in high school. Yeah. So, you know, you know, living with my mother, my mother never bad talked my father, but you start to hear and see hints that my father doesn't work for a living. <laughs> you know, I see the cars he drives, dressed impeccable during the day. And I'll never forget. Then I would see in my company, people approach my father. If I was with my father, giving my father a number. My father was a big time number writer uh, back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, if there was a Mount Rushmore of big time number writers in South Philly, my father was one of them. That's kind of like a lottery, right? Yeah, it's the street. It's the street number that comes out from a racetrack every day. You know, the first number comes out around three, the next one at four, and then the final number, three digit number. Uh, don't ask me how to explain it. It's 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 figured out by some math petition or whatever how the races come in or whatever. But it was big and you know it was huge. And um, anyway, um, I never, I would see guys come up to my father, Blizz. Give me two twenty eight for ten dollars, you know, straight. And I would, I, you know, being around now. By the time I'm hanging in her corners, and I'm starting to get educated, I actually see. And I'll never forget the one time a friend of mine in high school drops me. His father drops me off at the house before I get out of the car. He says, uh, "Give this to your father. Tell him uh, whatever number two eighteen five dollars straight, okay, for today, because it's still early before the number comes out. Got to get." And I remember walking in the house. And I say, Dad, Joe Fish, my friend Mikey DeLuca's father. Joe Fish said, "Give the, my father said, don't ever fucking take a number from anybody. Do you understand me? Now, I'm a, right? I'm again, I'm 15 years old. And he yeah. gives it to me. Don't fuck, you want to know why? And I'm like, why, Dad? I don't even, because that guy can say he gave me, he says he hit the number, to, say he gave me 218 and 219 comes out. But I, I, I tell my father 218. He can try to take a shot. At my father and say, no, I told your son 219. Do you understand? So he yeah. gave it to me. Don't ever fucking take a number from son. They want to play a number, let him give it to me. Because my father had a reputation. Like, he didn't have to write a number down. My father was just brilliant. It, it, that, makes, sense. it yeah, makes sense. Yeah, it did make sense. It did make sense. Yeah. And, that's the, and then, um, so as I didn't, you know, obviously when I get to be 17, 18, 19 years old, I know my father is involved. Uh, but I didn't know. Um, but now that's mid seventies and he's only got about another 10 years left be before he weeds himself out. He dies in 1989. But unbeknownst to me, I realized how serious from the rap sheet that I see that he was involved, you know, he was involved and he just, uh, had to give his, uh, you know, earnings. He was protected by, but if, uh, well, see Angelo Bruno, you know, family, and that's what his basically was. This is all prior before Angelo got killed in '80. But, and then I, I also recall when Angelo Bruno got killed. I only asked my father one time a question about his involvement or whatever. 
And this wasn't like, I'm not trying to depict a scene out of The Godfather when Michael Corleone tells his wife, Kate, you only get to ask me one time. I just happened to ask my dad. I, when, when Bruno got killed and then the war started and then there was talks in the media about the young, a new regime was coming in and, and, and approaching bookmakers and number writers on the street for street tax, right? Yeah. And I don't know what made me ask this question. And I said, yo, dad. Joke. Ralphie Head makes a comment. Sometimes you get the bear, but sometimes the bear would get you. And I'm laughing. I repeat it. I'm pulling the money. I got the money in my hand, and I feel it snatched out of my hand. And Salvi snatched the money out of my hand. Nine hundred dollars. I have, and I'm shocked. Right? And I, you know, it's Salvi, right? <laughs> 